Hi there, welcome to the new walkthrough video. Today we'll be talking about this paper, which is titled as Graph to Wick, Learning Distributed Representations of Graph by researchers from NTU Singapore. So naming the work as something to wick has become a de facto standard to how people usually write when they propose a mechanism for learning the semantic representation of some object, which is X over here. Now this could be word to wick, this could be paragraph to wick or doc to wick, let's say. This could even be subgraph to wick. So yeah. Let's start with the abstract. So before this time frame of 2017, the existing work predominantly focused on learning the semantic representations of smaller units such as nodes and subgraphs. But yeah, clearly as I mentioned, there could be many tasks that require the entire graph to be the input to the model. And you might want to train a deterministic model on top of graph, which means you want a graph to be represented as a fixed length feature vector, which is where this work comes into play. Also, this is one of the first works that talk about embedding the entire graph in an unsupervised way. As there was some early work that talked about embedding the graph based on some handcrafted features such as shortest path and graph reads. So in this work, we propose a neural embedding framework called graph to wake to learn a data driven distributed representation of arbitrary size graphs. And since the method that they're using is unsupervised in nature, that's why it is task agnostic which means it could be used in general with any downstream task with fine tuning or without fine tuning. So yeah, that's the great part of it. Also they show like graph to wake achieves significant improvements in terms of classification and clustering over earlier work that were based on substructure learning or which is subgraph learning and also the graph kernel such as graphlets and shortest path. So yeah, now let's delve into the method. But before that, authors also mentioned about key advantages of their approaches. So the first one is it is unsupervised in nature, which essentially means you do not require any class labels at graph level for learning the embeddings. So it is similar to something as word to wick, where again, you don't have any hand curated labels for every word. Rather, you try to create one based on the windowing technique. So it can be thought of as self supervised mostly. But yeah, that again lies more or less under unsupervised category. Then the second advantage is task agnostic embeddings. Now, since everything is being done in unsupervised fashion and is generic, so the embeddings learned are agnostic of the task and can be used as a seed or initialization to any downstream task that could be supervised in nature. So yeah, this is again similar to the concept of word to wake Well, let's say if you have trained a word to wake embeddings model, now you can use those vectors as initialization to let's say translation system. And on top of that, you learn the weights that are respective to translation model but you still have the privilege of fine tuning these embeddings for this particular downstream task. It again depends on you as a modeling choice if you want to do it or not. The third advantage that they talk about is data driven embeddings, where they mention that unlike existing graph kernels that use certain kind of handcrafted feature to define these embeddings. Whereas this approach, what authors propose is dependent on large corpus of graph data. As in, you should have many graphs and model is supposed to create its objective on its own and train on that. So the larger the number of graphs you have, you'll be getting more generalized model because of the fact that the training procedure would have seen different variations of it. And the last advantage that they talk about is about capturing structural equivalence. Okay, so earlier approaches such as sub to wick kind of sample linear substructures, which is like fixed length random box. Whereas if you know graphs are non-linear in nature, so in this framework, instead of sampling some linear structures, they talk about sampling rooted subgraphs, which are non-linear in nature, which kind of preserves the structural equivalency and the thing from which you're trying to sample, which is the entire graph is also non-linear in nature. So this gives kind of a better intuition and confidence compared to the earlier models, which majorly talked about sampling linear substructure. So yeah, these were the four advantages what authors talk about their work. So let's start with the problem statement formally. So let's say we were given graph set G, which has, let's say many graphs and we define a parameter, let's say Delta, which is the expected embedding size, like how much dimension we want to represent our graph into. So it could be like 50, 100, 150 and these kind of values. So the idea is to kind of learn a Delta dimensional representation for every graph G I, which belongs to this bigger set of G. So in matrix term, you can think of learning this phi matrix, which belongs in real space. And it's a 2d matrix where the rows are nothing but graphs. Let's say if we had 10 graphs, so this will be like 10 cross 10 are the number of rows and the column is the size of the Delta. So if it's like 150, which means for every graph, you want 150 dimension vector. So that would be the length of the column. So this will be Delta. Okay. 
So you represent every graph with a set of nodes n, edges e, and some function lambda. The well, lambda is a function that maps nodes to the labels. Okay, moving forward. Also, there could be cases where you have labels on edges. So in that case, you also define a function eta that takes in an edge or set of edges and map it to this special character, which is the label for that edge. Okay, so then they talk about subgraphs, which is given by these notations. And each of the nodes and edges are again subparts of the original graph. So they also define the notion of degree of a node n, which is nothing but all the d hop neighbors that you get from a central point n. Okay, let's move forward. So the idea that the authors propose, which is like converting a graph into a fixed length vector, is more or less similar to how you do doc to vec or paragraph to vec kind of systems. Where again the idea is, you're given a sentence which constitutes of words, but you want to learn sentence embeddings based on the words that occur in that. So here also the idea is inspired from doc to vec. So if we see more specifically to how doc to vec works, you have a set of documents d, let's say d1 to dn, and each of the documents is represented as sequence of words, which is w1 to wl. So these could be all of the words from the document or you could also sample certain words from that document. So the idea for doc to vec is again to learn a delta dimensional embeddings for the document di that belongs to set of all the documents that you have. So under this scheme, if you want to train a skip gram model, model is trying to maximize given a document d, what are the words that occur in the document? You want to maximize the log probability for that, where li is the number of words that you sample from that document. So here this conditional probability is reflected as the softmax function where the denominator you see is kind of a summation over entire vocabulary, which is all the words that are there across all the documents. So the part of softmax that will output a distribution between zero and one, and it would incur a higher loss in case you say something as close to one, but it was close to zero, which means you have said a word should lie in this document, rather which is not the case. So yeah, so we usually can think of doc to work working in this way. So let's say you have some document, think of this as sentence, it could be paragraph as well. This goes to the skip gram model, and at the output, you get a softmax distribution across entire vocabulary. And the idea is to train this model in such a fashion so that the words that you output that are close to one should lie in this document D. So people have proposed many optimization schemes on top of this, such as hierarchical softmax and negative sampling. So for doc to vec as well as in this paper for graph to vec authors employ this scheme of negative sampling. So the idea is that instead of having the softmax function in the output layer, you can define those number of sigmoid units based on the size of your vocabulary. And you can have a zero one classification for every word, whether this word should belong to this document or not. So since sigmoid is faster than calculating the entire summation of softmax. So this is one optimization scheme. On top of this, what they propose is to kind of sample K negative samples and one positive sample, which means you'll be only propagating based on the K plus one neurons instead of propagating the loss from all the neurons that you have in your vocabulary. So let's say if our vocabulary size was four, which is this case, and this was the positive sample. So this is what we pick up. And out of this three, if our K value was one, out of these three will sample just one, some random sample, let's say this one. So then this is a negative sample, this is a positive sample. And then we back propagate and adjust the weights based on the loss incurred from these two neurons only. So yeah, this is again one of the approximations that is made on top of this. And in practice, it is seen to work equally well. So yeah, that's the idea for doc to vec So if you see that idea similar in the case of graph to vec so here again, you have a graph ID. So you can have the analogy of graph as a sentence or as a paragraph, where in the output setting, you want to predict all the subgraphs that occur in the vocabulary. Instead in doc to vec you were supposed to predict all the words. Here, you try to predict all the subgraphs. So here, this rooted subgraph is considered as the smallest entity, which has an equivalent structure and semantics to the entire graph. So if given a graph, you are able to predict these smaller units, eventually we'll be learning the embeddings for the entire graph. So yeah, this is pretty much very much similar to how doc to vec works. So we'll see to this exact algorithm and what's rooted subgraph is and how do you create that as we proceed forward. Okay. So here authors define two reasons to why did they use rooted subgraph only for learning the graph embeddings and not something as nodes in the graph or random walks or shortest paths. So the first advantage is higher order substructure. So here they say like if you have a rooted subgraph, it's a much better representation than just considering the nodes by themselves. Because in subgraph, you also get edges and their neighborhoods, which could give you enriched structural and semantic representation of that unit. Hence, if you use those structures rather than using nodes, the semantics learned for the entire graph are much better. So again, if you can think of this analogy in terms of NLP, 
so we already said let's say graph was sentence and let's consider node to be the words in that sentence so now what they are saying is if you consider n grams let's say which is combination of couple of nodes which can be seen as a subgraph in this terminology you should ideally get a better representation for the entire sentence rather than just considering the words alone so yeah that was the comparison now let's talk about the second reason which is non linear substructure so since as we know like graphs are non linear in nature so if you use non linear substructures as smaller components that can be represented as a graph as a whole that's a better choice at any day if you're thinking of having some linear structures such as walks and paths for representing something that is non linear so yeah that's the idea for this and the main expectation that we have is that the structurally similar graphs will be close to each other in the embedding space so this is final thing that we want to learn okay so for mining these non linear substructures they use something called as wl kernel so we'll see to that what it does as we proceed forward okay so yeah now talking about the entire algorithm so this is the first pseudo code the function is called graph to vec it takes in all these parameters the first one is the set of graphs d is the maximum degree or the maximum hops that you want to make from some central node for sampling your subgraph where that central node is treated as the root for that subgraph and then you have delta which defines the embedding size that you want to learn then you have this coronary e kind of a structure which tells you about number of epochs and then alpha which is the learning rate and the output that we expect is a matrix phi that is of dimension number of graphs that you have and the embedding size so as the first step we initialize this embedding with some random vectors then for every epoch we do the shuffling of this set and then for each graph and for each node of that and also for degree variations from 0 to capital d which means let's say if your d was equal to 2 which means you want to consider all the subgraphs starting from zero hops to two hops from the central node where zero hop would mean that central node itself then at this granularity you do your back propagation step so let's take an example so let's say we have some graph and for first node that we have if our d value is equal to 2 the first update happens for n is equal to 1 and d is equal to 0 the central node the current graph and the degree this goes into this function that returns a list of subgraph which is then when you calculate your loss for this graph and model parameters phi are we able to predict those subgraphs with high probability or not so that is the loss that you calculate and then we do this update step on the parameters similarly for the second loop you will still have n equal to 1 but d will now become 1 which means you will be sampling the one hop neighbors and similarly when d is equal to 2 you will be sampling the two hop neighbors so yeah this is the graph to vec pseudo algorithm now let's see into what this graph wl subgraph function does Okay so this function takes in the central node the graph g and the degree and the output is a rooted subgraph of degree d around the node n so if degree d is equal to 0 then we return the label for the current node which is a central root node because the hop value is equal to 0 else if it is not equal to 0 let's say if d was equal to 1 then we do the breadth first search and get all the neighbors for this current node let's call it as n dash and we do the recursive call till we again hit this condition and we return that node value This is again nothing but the breadth first search that we are doing, and finally we append it with the central node value, and we return this thing. So yeah, this is nothing more than just doing a breadth first search till those number of hops, which is the degree value, and then returning those graphs. Okay. So yeah, once we get those graphs, then we have already seen we do this back propagation step. Okay. So yeah, now they have evaluation and stuff. So they also apply this negative sampling technique, which I mentioned earlier. So yeah, I think we are done with the paper now. So I do have a playlist of machine learning with graphs on this channel. I'll link to that in the i button. If you're really interested in this field, make sure to check those videos as well. As of now, I have roughly six videos I think over there. So I'm trying to chronologically cover every major segment that have been done in this research, starting from 2015, and this is from 2017, I guess. So the next paper will be from 2018. So yeah, having said that, if you like such content, make sure to hit that like button and subscribe to the channel. I'll meet you in the next one. Bye bye and take care.